Tim Lemire writes, Of the movies you've reviewed so far on the show, which one would make a good musical? The movie I have in mind is Marty. Big dumpy dudes seldom get to be the leads in musicals. No, no, they And they, they seldom get to be romantic leads. This is an opportunity to find unique talent that never would have been discovered otherwise. You find a dumpy schlub with a golden voice... You just sit back, collect your Tonys. That might also work as an opera. Oh, sure. Yeah, because the passions are so high in that. And the family is Italian. Oh, hey. You drop of the milk, I drop of the milk, you drop of the milk. Leche. <laughs> okay, what's yours? I'm going to go rock opera, Anya. Barbarella. You got all the sets, you got all the costume changes. Barbarella is a movie that almost needs to be a musical because it, it needs more. Yeah, it would be better as a musical. And then, of course, a really great candidate for musical treatment would be Roar, and it would be the <laughs> anti-Lion King. <laughs> the I, I, <laughs> I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good, it might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. Last time on this show, we watched The Wild One. And let me tell you, seeing that black rebel motorcycle club riding around on their sickles is quite a sight to behold. But I want them to go faster. Faster! If you haven't guessed by now, that is the theme for September. I want them to ditch those dumb motors and strap on some high-powered rockets so they can zip around through the air like some sort of rocketeer. Oh, you... You haven't seen The Rocketeer? This movie was on that original movie list that I made as a teen back in the early 90s, and it's also one that I have yet to see. Released in 1991, starring Billy Campbell, Jennifer Connelly, Alan Arkin, Timothy Dalton, and the late, great John Polito. The film was based on the comic book character created by writer-illustrator Dave Stevens in 1982. Many A-list actors auditioned for the lead role of this, including... Dennis Quaid, Kurt Russell, Bill Paxton, Emilio Estevez, Johnny Depp, and Vincent D'Onofrio, who was offered the role, but he turned it down. Director Joe Johnston convinced Disney to go with the then-unknown Billy Campbell as the Rocketeer. The film was not a flop, but it was a box office disappointment, grossing $46 million against a $40 million budget. That is technically a profit, but actually a loss. It's the magic of Hollywood. But it did benefit from the then burgeoning home video market, earning an additional $23 million in video and Laserdisc rentals. None by you, obviously. <laughs> nope. Being a rocketeer can be tough. When you're up there in the air, if you don't got somebody down there on the ground giving you information as to what's going on up there in the air, you could be in trouble. If you ever find yourself in this situation, you're going to need to know what to do and how to do it. Radio Telephone Procedure, <laughs> April 1974. Instructions on how to talk on the radio. This is it? That's all you need. Roger means, I have received your last transmission satisfactorily. <laughs> Why don't you fuel up and come on over to the old leather couch as we blast off together and watch The Rocketeer. Wilco! I meet Gestapo tactics! <laughs> Cliff Secord is a test pilot. He's flying this brand new airplane that was built by his buddy Peavy. If this test flight goes well, they're ready for nationals. They're getting ready for some kind of flying competition? I guess so. Flying competition called World War II. <laughs> thumb kiss! <laughs> There's a thumb kiss, Matt! Somewhere right now, Barry Bostwick's thumbs are tingling. I think this is 1937. <laughs> Meanwhile, the feds are chasing after this guy named Wilmer, who's stolen secrets. Cliff buzzes this chase and he gets shot at too why causing a lot of damage on his plane great now the plane's wearing blackface yeah great now he's wearing blackface wilbur drives into the hangar and he hides the stuff that he stole and swaps it out with this really sweet looking vacuum cleaner he makes a run for it, purposely crashes his car after jumping out of it. The plane is a bust because it's all busted up. That's our livelihood, the feds say. Ah, oh, we don't care. See you in the funny pages. Fisty cuffs. One more like that, you'll be eating salt poop for a month. In salt poop for a month? It appears in Wilmer's wrecked car that there's this burned up device. And that seems to be what the feds were looking for, and they think it's been destroyed. 
Cut to the office of Howard Hughes, the inventor of the X3, which is a jetpack. But Howard Hughes is worried about this falling into the wrong hands, so he burns the plans. Now if you'll get out of my office, I'm going to stay in here for the next four years. Cliff and Peavy meet with Bigelow, who is the guy who owns their hangar. Running things. It ain't all gravy. <laughs> they're going to be laid on the rent this month, and they're not going to be able to go to nationals. Well, I guess that means you got to dress up like a clown and fly around in my air circus. Ha ha ha. Eddie Valentine meets with Neville Sinclair, movie star. He wants that jetpack for some reason. Get me that gizmo. Someone's torturing a woman. <laughs> They find this mysterious thing that was hidden in their plane. It seems to be some sort of weird backpack. But there's a button on it. <laughs> Boom! Well, they're not going to try it out on themselves. That would be suicide. But maybe they can find someone around the size of a man in the form of a statue. First Robert E. Lee, <laughs> and now this. So they take Lucky Lindy out and shoot him off into the air. Woo, my biscuits are burning! <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, on Saturn... <laughs> well, there goes that rocket pack. But back it comes. That thing would just incinerate your gonads. I mean, everything, <laughs> everything down below would be just gone. Clifford goes and sees his sweetheart, Jenny Blake. Good night, Mrs. Pye. I can figure out Miss Pye's last name to over 2,000 decimal places. <laughs> she's an aspiring actress. And she's a huge fan of Neville Sinclair. This big nine-foot lunkhead named Lothar goes to Wilmer's hospital room. Where is the X3? He finds out, and he kills Wilmer. At the diner, we meet all kinds of colorful characters, including Malcolm, who flew during World War I. He's a little loopy in the head. We go to the set of The Laughing Bandit, and Jenny is an extra in that movie. Cliff goes to visit the set. He's peeping from behind a flat. He accidentally knocks it over and ruins a take. You okay, Mr. Sinclair? Oh, it's all right. I'm fine. But if I find the person who did that, they deserve to have their heads chopped off. <laughs> this is supposed to be a closed set. That Jenny Blake is to blame? Have her banned from the lot. Banned from the lot. Banned from the lot. Jenny Blake, she took the cake, and now she's not so hot. She's been banned from the lot. But before she leaves, Neville meets her, and he starts to turn on the charm. Why don't we go on a date tonight? I'll take you someplace fancy. Jenny's not too happy with Cliff right now, so she accepts. Cliff is late for the big air show. Malcolm finds out that Cliff is in trouble, so he puts on Cliff's clown costume, and he takes that plane up into the air. Why is wearing a clown outfit necessary for this act? <laughs> it's like radio ventriloquists who actually have the dummy there. <laughs> he can't fly, he's too old. Only one person can save that guy's life. A little luck. Puts on this fancy helmet that was made by Peavy, and off he flies. He gets into some hijinks with the biplane, and he ends up saving the day. The press see this rocket man, and they go nuts. This is front page news. A rocket man! What's the next line in Rocket Man? I can't think of it. I, I don't know. Why couldn't this be the Tiny Dancer Man? I have that one. <laughs> and they have to figure out what to call the guy. Should they call him Fiery Back? Do they call him the Missile Lad? Oh, or should they call him... How about Rocketeer? Yeah. So it hits all the papers that there is some sort of rocket ear out there. Who is he? What does he look like? Ooh. <laughs> Flying Man saves plot. Thanks for the diligence <laughs> of the effort. Mr. Bigelow, FBI, we'd like a word with you. Just a Bigelow and everywhere I go. <laughs> Back at Bigelow's office, we find the place has been torn apart and Bigelow has been killed. Oh no, Polito. He's as dead as John Polito. <laughs> Meanwhile, the giant goon goes to Cliff's house. I don't know this guy's name, but I'm guessing it's Ego. <clears throat> and he starts wrestling with him. The FBI also knows this address, so they show up. They get out their guns and they blast the house with bullets. Everybody just barely escapes. Neville and Jenny go out on their date to the South Seas Club. They got everything here. They got a big band, they got a big clam. Watch out, there's a clam behind you! <laughs> Feed me, Seymour! <laughs> it's a fancy place. Even W.C. Fields hangs out there. 
falling off any chandeliers lately. The whole third act of the movie turns into a W.C. Fields and it was like, yeah, let me try it on. Oh, a conflagration on my manhood. <laughs> my posterior has been flambéed. <laughs> Peavy and Cliff are hiding out in the attic at the diner. The gangsters show up. We're going to ring a ding ding. Tell us where Cliff Secord is. Talk, Dad, and get a facial. Drop dead, you weasel. Uh -huh. He is literally meeting Gestapo tactics. <laughs> they see a number on the wall, 8675309, let's call it. They find out from Jenny's roommate that she's over at the South Seas Club, and so the mob heads out there. And Cliff takes his rocket to rescue Jenny. But Peavy notices that the rocket's been damaged. There's a hole in it. If he tries to take off in it, he's gonna explode. It's a good thing that Cliff chews that Beeman's gum, because that's perfect to plug up the hole in the rocket. Chekhov's gum. <laughs> he goes to the South Seas Club, disguises himself as a waiter. He uses the old leave a note in the food trick. You have to get out of here. Neville's not to be trusted. She doesn't believe him at first, but she agrees to do it. Garber, 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 garber. It's too bad that Clifford doesn't have a girdle of ogre strength. Then he could take this guy. <laughs> the South Seas Club erupts into chaos. He's flying around, everybody's shooting at him. Jenny's about to get in a cab, but then she looks back and says, wow, everyone's screaming and scared. I better go back there. And she gets captured. Yeah, he caught you, idiot. She wakes up in a bedroom. Neville's there. He says, I'm sorry that I drugged you, but it's because I'm in love with you. Right, you get it? I feel something move inside me. I felt it tear loosened. I think I have appendicitis. <laughs> but Jenny sees through the lies. She conks Neville on the head. She instinctively knows that there's a secret door in the library. And she finds the right book and goes into a secret room. His secret Nazi hiding hole. Neville Sinclair is a Nazi spy. She gets captured by Neville and Lothar. Cliff goes back to the diner and gets a phone call. It's Eddie Valentine, the mob boss. Meet us at the Griffith Observatory with the rocket. If you don't show up, bad things will happen. What are they doing to Jenny? Quiet, Patsy. I gotta think. Patsy, I'm sorry. Patsy. You're just a you. But before he can do that, the feds catch him and they take him to meet with Howard Hughes. Go ahead, roll it. Mr. Hughes reveals that the Germans have a plan to create a huge sky Wehrmacht of rocket men who will invade and destroy America. That's why this is so important. They didn't know when they made this movie that being a Nazi in America would be okay eventually. <laughs> According to our president. <laughs> Cliff says, I understand, Mr. Hughes, but I gotta use this rocket one more time. I gotta go save my girl. Kid, I can slap you with grand theft, treason, espionage. And I can literally slap you. Cliff escapes. He goes to the rendezvous. <laughs> Come on, kid, hand it over so we can all go home. I gotta sue the sauce. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> he tells Eddie Valentine that this guy's a Nazi. We've got proof there's a room. Hey, I may be a mobster, but I'm an American. I don't support fascists. Little does he know that Sinclair's got a Zeppelin who's coming to pick him up, and he's got a squadron of Nazi soldiers who comes out of the bushes. Just then the FBI shows up. Jenny is taken to the Zeppelin by the Lunkhead and Sinclair. They fly off. Rocketeer goes off. Did he just burn an American flag? <laughs> Who is it? We must radio for help. Quick, where is our pamphlet? <laughs> Darcy's punching out in my face. Hand over the rocket. He peels that gum off of the hole. There you go, buddy. You go away and fly off. Jenny shoots a flare gun off to try to save her boyfriend. Starts a fire on a blimp. Never a good idea. Sinclair says, so long, I'm gonna rock it away. Uh-oh. Boom. He blows up the Hollywood land sign, but just the last four letters of it. Back on top of the Zeppelin, which is slowly blowing up. Oh, the humanity, there I said it. <laughs> What's that up in the sky? It's Howard Hughes. A gyrocopter made entirely out of Greek sandwiches and rescues them. Let's get out of here. Back at the diner, everything is back to normal. Howard Hughes thanks Cliff for his heroism. Ah, uh, Sam Shepard. And he gives him the gift of a new plane. Nationals, here we come. R-O-C-K-T. 
E R. You saw this when it was first released in the mm -hmm. theater? Yes. How does it hold up? I would say it works better in 1991 and also works better if you're 17 years old. It had been 10 years since Raiders of the Lost Ark came out. There was a movie that came out that looked like this every year or two. This is what I came to expect from Hollywood blockbusters. They really wanted this character to be Indiana Jones with a jetpack. Yes. And it wasn't. You know, they had the look right, but there was something about the feel of this movie that wasn't right. And they're this close. Everything is this close to being perfect. It takes a lot more than a cool leather jacket. And it is a cool leather jacket to make you into Indiana Jones. Well, that brings us to the performance of Mr. Billy Campbell. Yes. You don't seem very impressed. No, no, I'm not. He's He, he looks right. He has that all-American boy feel about him? I think he was the best choice among that group of guys that tried out. They are better stars, but I think he's more suited to the part. He didn't have that dazzling quality that... It, he's a it, bit bland. Yeah. I didn't have that much of a problem with Mr. Campbell's performance, and I really didn't have much of a problem with this movie. The plot was pretty good. Mm -hmm. The dialogue was serviceable. You know, the romance was nice. The one thing I hated, it was one stupid plot point. She's at the taxi, and she sees the danger inside the club, and she flees back towards it. There could have been a better way that they could have gotten her back into the hands of Neville Sinclair. I do basically like Jenny as a character. To a degree, she was a damsel in distress, but she also was prepared to fight back. She did things. She saved the plans. Right. And she figures out that he's a Nazi. And she figures out that there was a secret door in the house. Yeah, there has <laughs> to be somewhere. <laughs> Rocketeer creator Dave Stevens claimed that he was 70% satisfied with this movie. What was the 30% in your opinion that went wrong? It wasn't enough of its own beast. You know how Robert Zemeckis and Joe Dante would make movies that felt like Steven Spielberg movies? This is a movie that felt like a Zemeckis or Dante movie, and that's just like one generation to It's a far. copy of a copy. Yeah. Lothar is based on an actual actor from around this time period who looked just like that. When you see a close-up of him talking, that was a mistake. Yeah. He may as well be just wearing a rubber Nixon mask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He shouldn't have talked at all. This movie gave us something that I never thought we would get on this show. A, a Hall of Fame member that I thought would never make a re reappearance. This movie gave us a thumb kiss. Yes. We're going to have to update the website. Yeah. <laughs> it's back. And was someone involved with this movie a fan of Megaforce? I don't know. No one's a fan of Megaforce. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the visuals in this. I thought the special effects were pretty good. A lot of it seemed to be happening in real life. When they dropped the Rocketeer off the wing of a biplane, that's a man being dropped off the wing of a biplane. With the green screen stuff, you can see the strings, but it's good enough. Yeah. It's, it's held up over all these years. Yeah, I'd say the only thing that looked particularly fake was Neville's death. I know there was one bit of cinematography in this that you were impressed with, a match cut. When I was just a kid seeing this movie, I was like, oh, I never saw that before. And I think that was a little bit of a formative moment for me as far as it's one more thing I got about movies. Oh, that's how you can go from one scene to another. I would have loved for there to be another twist. After Neville is killed, the real Nazi spy master steps out. And it's W.C. Fields. <laughs> I believe those plans are mine. One thing I do love about this movie, this poster. I don't know how you could see that poster and not want to see that movie. Mm -hmm. Seems as though the movie didn't follow through enough on the poster. Yeah. The Rocketeer may not be perfect, but it's a fine way to spend a Sunday afternoon. I get down in the movie, but it's fun. Everything can't be Jaws. Now that the Rocketeer has concluded, it is time for Scenic to begin. Scenic! The theme for today's Scenic is Mailbox, because these are all movies that were sent to our P.O. Box by our viewers. We watched a bunch of them, and we're going to talk about them. Doom. Scenic. This stars Dwayne The Rock Johnson before he was funny and charming. And it stars Carl Urban looking very much like a pre-mustache Ron Swanson. And then there's also Rosamund Pike. She's Who is way overqualified to be in this thing. <laughs> she says one of my favorite lines that I've heard in a long time. Has it ever bothered you that you could have spent your life looking through a microscope instead of a sniper scope? <laughs> That line is just fantastically terrible. This is based on the video game of the same name. I don't have any interest in video games, but I still really enjoyed this movie, even when it turned into 
a first-person shooter game. Oh, yeah, that's right. Towards the end. It's fine. It really puts you in the action. That's why you play video games. I really like the fact that the male and female protagonists were estranged brother and sister. That was very odd. You would expect them to be Mm -hmm. ex-lovers that would rekindle their romance, and I I thought that was a really nice touch. Next up, we have Dreamcatcher. Seen it. Not seen it. That's probably for the best. Yeah, from what I hear. I know we've talked about this on the show before. I watched this movie right before we started doing this show, and I regret it so much. This would be another Tough Guys Don't Dance. (laughs) That's how bad this movie is. There's this group of middle-aged men who have this kind of vernacular that they talk in, and they say these goofy words. Like, Stephen King was trying to invent slang. Mm-hmm. It's very tone-deaf and dumb. There are aliens that crawl up your butt, and they're called shit weasels. Morgan Freeman has ridiculous eyebrows. I uh, call them shit weasels. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have Johnny Got His Gun. Based on a novel by Dalton Trumbo and directed by Dalton Trumbo. That's I right. I had no idea. Big commie mustache himself. So if you think <laughs> Stalin is a commie mustache? Check this out. I don't know if this was his first project or if he had directed before. The whole thing sort of smacks of a director who knows what he's doing and kind of doesn't know what he's doing at the same time. You're seeing things that you would never see from a seasoned director. Yeah. And that really makes this film unique. In a good way or a bad way? In a good way. But it also has a real B-movie quality to it. But this movie does have an emotional impact. Oh, yeah. And it does have these scenes that take place in the guy's mind, and you can't tell if they're flashbacks or hallucinations or a combination of the two. What is Jason Robards? Is he a carnival barker or is he dad? My favorite two scenes in this movie are the ones with Donald Sutherland playing Jesus Christ. Out of all the cinematic Jesuses I've ever seen... He's the one I want to actually be Jesus, where he's just this kind, understanding person, but occasionally there's just something that he's not strong enough to lift. And finally, we have a movie courtesy of this Werner Herzog box set, and that is The Enigma of Casper Hauser. Seen it. Seen it. Or as I like to call it, Werner Herzog's Room. This is based on a true life story from the 1800s. A young boy shows up. He claims to have been locked in a room since birth and has never seen the outside world, has never seen people. It really reminds me of a book that you turned me on to, that City of Glass by Mm -hmm. Paul Auster, which is a hell of a book. So he's this nothing person who eventually becomes this kind of learned holy fool. Yes. You know, he has these observations that other people can't comprehend. The giant tower is smaller than his room. Because he can turn away from the tower and the tower disappears. But wherever he turns in the room, he always sees the room. Yeah. Bruno S. does a great job as the lead character. But seems to be about 20 to 25 years too old to play Mm -hmm. the part. Herzog found him on the street. Oh, okay. So he's this complete... Untrained actor. Playing an untrained human being. If you have a Seen It suggestion, you can leave it in the comments and we might feature it on Seen It. Or if it suits your fancy, you can send it to us and we might watch it, talk about it on the show. Also, go to our website, welcometothebasementshow.com. Click on the donation button and contribute a few dollars to support this show. You can make a one-time donation or a rolling monthly donation. Some of our recent rolling monthly donors are Grace, Patches, Jennifer, Marie, and T.A. Epley. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Loser Baby writes, Ever watch any of Buster Keaton's films? They are the best. We have. In fact, we are appearing on a brand new podcast called the Talking Buster Keaton Podcast. That series drops on October 3rd, and our episode is coming out January 16th. But you should listen to the whole thing because I think it's going to be really fascinating. The Rocketeer. If you haven't seen it, check it out. And check out this. You look awful blue for a guy who pretty much saved the world. Yeah, well, I guess I got the crack ribs to prove it. You got me? I'll crack your ribs. Be a little rib cracker. Crack those ribs. That's how I get off. Jenny. (laughs) I like to break bones. Hand over the rocket!